Hello everybody yes. and welcome to the Below Level 2 podcast. My name is Kelly Adams. I'm the product manager of Level 1 Introductory um, Entry and Personal Growth and Wellbeing and Work Skills. On our podcast today we have Harriet Bly. Harriet is going to talk to us about promoting mental health and wellbeing practices for learners. Um, Harriet, commonly known as Hattie, will uh, introduce herself and I hope you enjoy this podcast. Hiya, my name's Hattie. Um, I am a training and CPD delivery manager here at Pearson. So I organise training and uh, resources for BTEC level one to three functional skills. Um, and I also work in mental health first aid. And um, alongside that, I've also completed my youth mental health first aid uh, training. And um, I'm also in interested in neurodiversity and neuro inclusion. Um, so I look at things like accessible technology and um, teaching and learning practices that promote a neuro inclusive classroom. So today I'm with you to talk to you about promoting mental health and wellbeing practices for learners. Um, and I wanted to chat to you about how we can recognise signs and, and risk factors in learners and lower ability learners how we can have conversations with learners um, about mental health and well-being, mindfulness practices and grounding practices, um, and uh, some cognitive behavioural therapy practices as well. So just to start off, um, we can have a look at some signs and risk factors that um, we may be able to see in learners. So stigma and discrimination, physical illness or disability, family and home life, learning difficulties, bullying or cyberbullying, early behavioural difficulties, family factors like bereavement and instability, and socioeconomic factors like housing, education, healthcare and employment could contribute to a learner's mental ill health. Um, and you're not expected to know everything about a learner's life. Um, but if you do happen to know that they are um, kind of more vulnerable to some of these factors, it is something, you know, worth looking out for. Um, you can kind of implement these short, some short wellbeing practices into your classroom in order to kind of alleviate some of the things that these factors could um, cause within a learner's mental health or wellbeing and just sort of teach them how to regulate the emotions that come with this. So what are mindfulness and grounding practices? Um, there are a lot of easy and simple mindfulness practices available on YouTube, um, which I like using sometimes if I'm feeling a bit anxious, um, or there's certain apps like Calm or Headspace, which might be useful for some learners, or you know, you, yourself. Um, in a classroom scenario, uh, you can kind of start or end a lesson with a mindfulness exercise. And I know that this is done in some um, in some classroom settings where it's almost kind of like a, you know, you bookend the class with a mindfulness technique or a grounding practice. So just to kind of get you caught up on what mindfulness is, um, it's the awareness which comes from noticing the present moment without judgment and with kindness, accepting whatever you observe. So often it can be kind of focusing in on each of your senses. So we notice what we feel, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, what we smell. Um, and these kind of focuses on the senses um, are kind of built into a lot of mindfulness practices that we are going to run through um, in, a, in a moment. Um, what I'd quite like to share with you is some quicker mindfulness practices um, that can be introduced into a classroom setting and are really simple for people to understand. So they're kind of guided mindfulness practices that you yourself could guide um, that should kind of, you know, help learners see the, the benefit of mindfulness. So how can mindfulness help learners? So um, there's a lot of research to suggest that mindfulness improves focus and con concentration. 
um, and it also compassion and conflict resolution skills. What mindfulness can do is help us to bypass some of those stress triggers in the brain to help us get better at some, something like conflict resolution or compassion. So we don't go straight to anger. We go to, OK, well, what what could happen here to make this conflict, uh, you know, much calmer or how can I regulate myself and help others regulate themselves to not go straight for the this kind of immediate knee jerk reaction. Grounding is quite similar to mindfulness, um, although it can be seen more as um, like a grounding is the first step towards mindfulness. Um, so it aims to situate you in the present moment by noticing and focusing on your senses. So we can do a grounding technique and then move on to a mindfulness technique. And sometimes they can kind of cross paths or there's some kind of, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of similarities between the two. Um, but grounding is more used. Let's say if somebody's having a panic attack, grounding might be a better exercise because it kind of, it's it's almost sort of forcing you back into the the reality of now of what your body is experiencing now and um appreciating that this is this is the moment that we're in kind of thing um so there are a few mindfulness and grounding techniques in the classroom that i would like to share with you um and the first one is the five four three two one technique so here we would ask a learner to identify five things they can see, four things they can feel, three things they can hear, two things they can smell and one thing they can taste. Now, this can be adapted for like a quieter environment or situations where they may not be able to, let's say, taste anything, because that can be quite a difficult one, um, like if you're not eating something. Um, so you can ask them to think about their favourite sounds if they can't hear anything, maybe like a song they like or the sound of the wind or the sea or imagine their favourite tastes. So think about a taste that you do like or, or a taste that is particularly strong. I don't know, something like ginger or chilli um, to just kind of simulate that sense in a, in a way if it's not possible to, um, to simulate it in kind of real life. Um, box breathing and diaphragmatic breathing. So that's kind of if you breathe in and you expand your your tummy rather than your chest, that's kind of diaphragmatic breathing. And we can control that in a way where kind of a lot of the practices are kind of breathing for six, holding for two, three, six, whatever's easiest, and then breathe out for six. So that you count into six as you're breathing in you hold and then you count to six again as you're breathing out and that kind of <clears throat> um, regulates your diaphragm and box breathing the reason it's called box breathing this might actually just be something I call it or it might be something that I found on YouTube I can't remember um, but box breathing is following a little video so you can um, type it into YouTube box breathing or triangle breathing and it's a visual stimulus of kind of a box opening and then closing or a triangle kind of opening up and then closing back down. And you breathe along with the visual kind of stimulus of uh, the triangle or the box. And it, it makes it easier to kind of do it because you're not regulating it yourself as you would be doing if you were counting. You're relying on this visual, which is, makes it a lot easier, particularly if you're in kind of a state of anxiety or panic. It might be a lot easier to have that visual stimulation. Um, another one that I wanted to share was um, creating a safe space inside your head. So this one might take, let's say, 10 minutes to complete if you're doing this in a classroom setting. Um, and this is actually something that we can go back to once we've done it you know we we kind of store it away um so what we would ask a learner to do and we we can do it ourselves alongside them is imagine a calm place that's nothing to do with work school or home 
maybe a place that they've seen on TV or in a film or something that they've read about in a book, somewhere they've visited, somewhere they've imagined. It could be like space. Um, the aim here is to have like a mental image that we can immerse ourselves in when we feel stressed. And at the end of the practice, we would imagine putting that image in a box in our head and storing it away for when we need it next. And when we're creating this safe space inside our heads, we think about things like the shapes that we can see, we focus on those shapes, the smells, the tastes, the sounds, what we can feel, if there's wind, rain, if we can hear the sea, you know, we're kind of really focusing on um, imagining those um, sensory states. So, Kelly, I think we were going to try the five, four, three, two, one technique. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, so, have you got? Could you tell me five things that you could see? Okay, so I can see a green flood house with interestingly red um, pipes for its water. It's guttering, so red pipes. I can see my dog on the floor doing something strange. Um, I can see a tree outside my window and I can see a bird, I think it's a seagull, just flying into the tree and the blue sky with the clouds. I think that's five. That is five. Normally, I think if we, if we were doing this, like, um, you know, if you particularly needed to calm down, what I would probably ask you to do is, OK, well, what, what colours can you see in the tree? Um, what does the dog feel like? You know, if you stroke the dog, really yeah. focus on kind of the soft fur. Um, can you can you touch any of those things and and tell me about the sensory experience of touching them? Um, so yeah, and thinking about things like shapes, maybe smells. Um, yeah, but that, I think that's yeah, that's a good yeah. I think cool start. well, the touch of the dog can does actually calm me down a lot. Yeah, more. you find that touching a lot with things dog. like this. Um, so that moves us on quite nicely to four things that you can feel. Okay, so I can feel the desk with my hands, with my hands the lid on the desk. I can feel the floor with my feet. Um, I can feel the temperature around me that probably I wouldn't actually normally think about, to be honest. Hmm. And I can feel um, my shoulders quite relaxed. Um, while I'm sat here uh, and feeling that, so quite relaxed at the moment. Cool. And again, we can we can kind of drill down deeper into those if we wanted to, if we wanted to really kind of um, focus on on the senses and how they're being simulated stimulated there. I could ask you, okay, does the desk feel cold? Um, you know, just just kind of more questions about what you've um what you felt there um but we will move on for for time's sake to um three things that you can hear if you have three things that you can hear okay. i can hear you um, talking at the moment but if you just heard that my dog just made a really big whining noise <laughs> yeah i heard that too <laughs> yeah you heard that too so yeah that was good timing buster well done <laughs> um and i can hear the whirring of the computer the calm whirring of the fan. <laughs> um, have you got two things that you can smell? Um, well, actually, funnily enough, the dog had to go to the room yesterday and for some reason they put dog perfume on. Dog perfume? Smelled, yeah, dog aftershave or something. So at the moment, it's got dog aftershave on, so I'll just call it <laughs> dog aftershave, which makes me cough and sneeze, I must admit. Um, <laughs> Smell-wise... I can't smell anything else because I'm obviously in the office at the moment. And I would imagine that the dog perfume, its it sounds like an overwhelming experience. It is an overwhelming experience. <laughs> I tell um, them not to put so much on, but they always do. <laughs> um, have you got one thing that you can taste? I don't hear. Um, I can say this morning that I had toast, wholemeal toast. So I guess that would be the closest thing to taste that I would have right now. Yeah. Um, I don't really have a drink here either. Well, I do, but it's in my uh, sensory box. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, that's all I can taste. What I had this morning. 
often yeah you will find that with taste especially if you're doing it in a classroom unless you're doing it kind of after lunch um taste is often the most difficult one um so again like what i would sort of suggest doing um if you needed to focus on that sense and you've got nothing that you can taste is think about your favorite taste or think about foods that you really like or strong flavors um that's kind of you know something that seems to work quite well um we've also got something called progressive muscle relaxation or checking in um that i forgot to mention in in that list <laughs> so um progressive muscle relaxation or checking in so we start from our feet or you can start anywhere in your body i i like to start from my feet and we focus on our toes so focus all our thoughts on the toes then move up in onto the balls of the feet then the the middle of the feet what's that bit called kelly what's that bit of your feet called the arch yeah <laughs> what's the that? middle bit the arch the middle bit yes yeah <laughs> and then move up to your heels your ankles your shins and calves knees um all the way up the legs and just kind of focusing on each thing now i like to do this where um whatever i'm focusing on i focus on it for five breaths but you can do it for what however long you want um you know there's there's no rules with stuff like this just fit it to kind of whatever you you prefer and whatever you need like for example um you, so you're supposed to kind of focus on the whole body in turn so you you end up if you start at the feet you end up at the top of the head and if you start at the top of the head you end up at the feet and you kind of move through the whole body focusing on different areas and um just of adapting it to to your needs so sometimes um i have trouble with panic attacks and um the uh the main kind of symptom for me is sometimes i get chest pains with that now when i'm doing checking in or progressive muscle relaxation focusing on my chest isn't going to help me because it it kind of it makes me think oh no, I'm having a panic attack, even when I'm not, because I'm kind of honing in on that area of my body that does tend to um, exhibit the symptoms of panic the most. So you can just, you can adapt it to whatever you need. There's no rules. Um, and just at the bottom there, and I'll we'll post it in the description, is Pearson's Guide to Introducing Mindfulness in Schools, um, which is a brilliant resource. I agree. So cognitive behavioural therapy. Um, so what is cognitive behavioural therapy or CBT? CBT is a type of talking therapy aimed at helping to improve mental health by changing the way we think and behave. It's based on the idea that thoughts, feelings and physical sensations are all linked. Uh, there are simple ways that we can implement the principles of CBT within the classroom and in conversations with young people about their mental health and well-being. Um, so we are not expecting anybody to be a CBT practitioner. You know, these are very simple ways of implementing CBT principles rather than practicing CBT. Um, so one of the one of the big ones, certainly, um, if I'm speaking to a young person or, a, you know, an adult, um, it can be really helpful if somebody's feeling anxious or, you know, panicked or sad is we interrogate what evidence a person has for that thought. So building a picture of how much evidence for and against an anxious thought can help us rationalise it and can help us see the bigger picture. So one thing that would kind of encompass CBT uh, principles um, within the classroom is you could ask your learners to write down an anxious thought that they have and make a column, you know, draw a line down the middle of the page, write the anxious thought down at the top and write for and against in the columns and um, just kind of go through with them or ask them to go through what evidence do you have for this anxious thought and what evidence is there against the anxious thought and just really interrogate the, the evidence that they have. Is it strong evidence and can we kind of control the outcomes? Um, so we can then ask the learners to identify a realistic outcome according to the for and against columns that they have made. 
Um, and often seeing those for and against pieces of evidence can kind of take the sting out of them a little bit. It can kind of make them look at it and think, actually, that four column doesn't make any sense. Nothing that I've written down that was in my head previously is logical. And this can, as I say, help us rationalise it. Um, so this is quite an easy way to implement CBT uh, practices or principles into just conversations and kind of just slipping it into conversations about uh, how a learner is feeling. Um, and it's it's helpful for adults as well. You know, I, I think getting those thoughts down and trying to weigh up the evidence for and against um, is, you know, a, a really simple way of, as I say, rationalising these thoughts. That's good. So sensory box. What is a sensory box? Um, a sensory box is a small portable box that we can fill with items that stimulate all of our senses. Now I've talked about senses before in, dis in some discussions about mindfulness and grounding. Um, the items should be small and the box should be able to fit in the learner's bag. Um, the box should contain, as I say, items that can uh, be used to simulate touch, smell, taste, sight and sound. Um, so just giving you some exa examples here. Um, for touch, it could be something, you know, soft or a fidget toy, something velvety, something spiky, if you like that sort of thing. I don't know. Um, some people prefer more sort of like a, a hard surface um, and some people prefer more of a soft surface. So whatever you prefer, you know, this is your sensory box and it should be designed around your needs. Um, so smell, maybe a cloth sprayed with some essential oil. Um, a lavender bag or a sample of your favourite perfume. So taste. One thing I would say about taste is you don't want to put something in your sensory box that's going to, you know, be sticky or I would suggest definitely more sort of boiled sweets, chewing gum, tea bags, maybe some dried fruit, something like that, rather than, you know, chocolate biscuits, because it's it's not particularly practical for the sensory box. Um, so sight, maybe photographs of family or friends or something that makes you happy to look at. Um, sound, headphones to plug into your phone to listen to some calming music or a podcast. Maybe a small music box. You might have seen them. There's those tiny, tiny music boxes where you wind them around and it plays like the Game of Thrones theme or something. Um, or maybe something that rattles or a fidget toy might be a, a good idea. So. As I say, we can adapt our sensory box to match our needs or interests or personalities. Um, and we've made our own sensory boxes to go through yeah. with you today. So <laughs> shall we do it so that we go through a sense each? Like, try. so I have this gorgeous biscuit tin from my grandma <laughs> that's got loads of cats on it. Um, I and I've got a mundane plastic box. <laughs> see it doesn't matter what uh, to be fair like this so this box it could do with being a bit smaller but I didn't have a smaller box to hand now if I was going to take this out if I needed it you know and um, say I was a learner and I wanted to take it to school I would probably look for a smaller box because it doesn't need to be this big yeah. but it can be as, as big or small as you need it to be so Kelly, if I wanted we... to be really impractical, I would put my dog in my sensory box. So would do that. <laughs> yeah. It's quite yeah. impractical. How big yeah. is your dog? How? How big is your dog? It's only a Shih Tzu. Oh, we... it's a big Shih Tzu. A big oh, Shih Tzu. okay. Well, <laughs> I mean, you could, but maybe don't. No, maybe don't. So, mm. should we start with sight? I don't think you can see it. Shall I take my? I don't have to take my background off. Yeah. If you do. Uh, what got Much better. Okay. So this is my sight one. <laughs> so this is um Wembley last year, Sheffield Wednesday versus Barnsley. And that little picture there 
the little tributary of it again is Josh Windax, um, who scored the winning goal. So that's a happy memory. So that's why that's in my sensory box. Oh, that's so sweet. I have a fairly similar one, actually. Well, I have a picture of Kevin De Bruyne, who's <laughs> my favourite <laughs> player for Manchester City. Um, and yeah, similar sort of thing. I look at him and feel nothing but joy and pride. Um, so that's why he's in there. I got some postcards from Manchester City and I had to make a choice between whether to include him, Grealish, Foden or Diaz. And he he won. So that's why okay. Kevin's in there. Okay. <laughs> um, what have you got for sound? I think this one's really difficult. OK, so I put in here my wonderful Apple Max headphones. Actually, I can talk about the sound more. It's not necessarily um, a sound thing like that plays, but a particular piece of music. So when I'm having a bit of a rough time, I always play a song which nobody will know called, it's, well, there's two actually. Um, one is the book by somebody called Drake White, and Drake White sings one with somebody called something McAnally. And one, one of those songs is Every Day is Once in a Lifetime. So that's the first song. Um, the second song is quite important to me because it gets to me through tough times. It's called The Close to Clear. And basically what the song is telling you is that everything's okay. Try something new. Don't be scared of trying something new. And I think that I find that very, very helpful to listen to when I'm going through a tough time, that everything will be okay. You're okay to try something new and, and get it wrong. So that's my music, really, that I would listen to on, on those headphones really lovely maybe we could put the youtube clips in the in the description so that maybe other people could listen yeah the very 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 if you listen to the lyrics it, it cheers you up a little bit so it's quite oh quite nice that's nice i also have my headphones that i put in my box too um i'm not quite sure what i'd listen to i think so there's there's a band that i love that calm me down um and make me feel very at peace called Fever Ray. They're a Swedish synthwave band who I'm actually going to see next week and I'm very excited. Um, so yeah, I've got those headphones in. Um, but I also have something that kind of straddles between uh, like touch and sound. So I've got this bag of like old sort of foreign coins. Yeah. You know when you come home from holiday and you've just got loads of weird coins yeah. um, in your pockets? <laughs> so I've, I've got a lot of them in this little bag and I think it sounds nice and it feels yeah. the bag itself feels nice it's quite um it's, it is quite a sensory experience this this bag itself um with the sound and the touch um yeah so I thought I'd I'd put that in there as well so that that does kind of straddle the line between feel and sound um yeah. which moves us nicely on to touch okay so touch for me, I've got the little fidget spinnery thing where you can touch and you can, I'm sure sure people have seen this before, you can touch <laughs> and move things. Actually, normally I probably wouldn't do that. I like to doodle. So I like to, that calms me, the sense of doodling on, on a pad and things like that. So unless I was really stressed, I, if I was really stressed, I would use this. But if I wasn't, I would I just do the doodling. It just calms me down just do the strokes of the pen cool i've got found this little ribbon which is it feels really sort of hardy and um it's it's quite nice to sort of just run you run through your fingers and it's i don't know if you can hear it's quite like this feels like an asmr video this feels tiny like it's descended into tiny, asmr tiny bit tiny bit i can hear <laughs> Yeah, um, but this is it, it feels really nice and it looks nice. So I've I've put that in there, but also I've got this little sort of fluffy ball, which is quite nice. It fell off. I say it fell off. I accidentally pulled this off my, <laughs> my hot water bottle, so straight in the sensory box it went. Um so I've got quite a few for touch actually. I've I do find it quite but personally, I think touch is quite a good one for, for grounding and um yeah. having those sorts of those three different senses of touch, those three different experiences of touch, sorry. So I do have this fluffy ball, the um, 
the like ribbon thing and the bag of coins and I think they all kind of provide a bit of a different experience so I, I threw them all in I thought why not they're small items and that's what it's kind of designed to be um taste Okay, so I've got five drinks that I try not to drink much of. So Dr. Pepper Zero. Uh, and also I ate no jar advice and I bought a bit of pepper. <laughs> At least it's wrapped up. <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've, I've got a similar thing. I mean, I just, I don't think it's worth throwing in like loose chocolate biscuits. No, no. <laughs> I think that not. would be, that would be misguided. <laughs> but something wrapped up like bar of chocolate or mini rolls or something like that I I think is a good idea I've got some um lime infused mango mm. which I absolutely love and it's quite a strong taste as well so that's quite good for grounding um mm. smell oh, so I've got I really like but, but I don't use them enough a little candle um, so I like the I used to like not so much anymore, but I used to like the anti candles because they used to put all the different smells that you can get. Mm. So that quite relaxes me when I when I like a candle and I've got lots of different kinds of candles. So I would go with that one. Yeah, I've got a similar thing. I've got um this oh this um wax melt because yeah. they're quite strong smells wax melts. Um, so I've got this spiced orange wax melt, which I haven't put in the wax melt burner yet. Yeah. So I thought, fling it in there. And I've also got some um, coconut oil as well, um, which I think smells really nice. And you could also, if you wanted to, if you had some essential oil in your um, sensory box, sometimes it's a good idea to put it on your pulse points on, say, like behind your ears or your wrists. Um, sometimes it's quite good because then you can carry that kind of sensory um, experience around with you a bit more and um, it can it can also just be like a little boost of confidence just think, thinking I smell great who doesn't love to feel like that <laughs> yeah I have a favorite perfume it's um, is it Armani it's been on a long time now I can't think what the word is for it it's Armani and it's just in the silver tub and I just love that smell um, I don't wear it often enough these days in the office I'm in the office but I, like I don't it. know that one. Um, yeah, I think not being in I the office. I think it's called Man Is She or something like that. Uh, um, right. Yeah, no, I don't know. I love that. that smell. It's pretty expensive, though. Well, those little, like, samples, the, the little yeah. perfume samples, I think you used to get them in magazines, but those days are gone. Gone. It's <laughs> but... <laughs> smell thing. <laughs> um they're they're quite good for boxes like these because they're so small. Rather than putting, like, a big, expensive bottle yeah. of yeah, perfume in there. If you do have a few like perfume samples knocking about, they're quite good to to be putting in in here. Um, another thing, so I've got this, and I didn't put it in, but I should have. And this is, I don't really have any fidget toys, um, but I've got this like little water game. I don't know if you can oh, see yeah. that where yeah. you press the yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's going in now. There, yeah. that's my yeah, final bit. It. Excellent. So I think um, hopefully people have learned quite a lot from looking at our sensory boxes as well um, <laughs> and finding out more. Actually, I should have mentioned that on the back, now we can see in the background, on the back that's straight white on that picture there with the hat ah. on. So I went to see him last year. I've seen him twice, but I've seen him last year in Newcastle that was. So I just sort of point that out since I've removed my Pearson corporate background. <laughs> um, thank you so much, um, Hattie, for talking us through that. I think people um who are listening that are looking to support particularly learners with different that are differently abled or any learners that are particularly having difficult challenges at the moment will really appreciate that advice and hopefully we've given them some practical tips to support them so thank you very much and uh, happy for coming on and talking to us about this no thank you for having me I think it's a really important conversation to have and it doesn't have to be daunting it can be easy conversations and we ultimately want everyone to feel empowered to have them. We want teachers to feel empowered to be able to speak about things like mental health and well-being. And we want learners to have the language to be able to talk about it themselves as well. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you.